program for some quarter of an hour. And um, I expect that some of you may be waiting for a magisterial resume for a of <laughs> all the nonsense from the last two days. But unfortunately, I have not time to do that because we're running behind. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have done it. Um, I blame myself for giving this closing assertion a paradoxical title of next piece. Um, you obviously know where it comes from, since it's kind of driven with some of the dynamics of the program. Um, next piece seems to, to me, as a phrase, seems to evoke the queue, waiting your place in the queue to be served by someone behind the counter, or waiting in the waiting room <coughs> and surgery and being called for by the receptionist or the system. Um, in other words, mundane, routine, administrative, not evoking a great deal of excitement. Um, and that's partly one of my complaints about it as a title, because um, that mundanity isn't reflected in what follows the rest of the poem, quite the opposite. Um, I used it here because I was hoping that by the time we'd reach this point in the conference, there would be a kind of much more exciting next piece. What's next, in other words? Um, and I've got a few ideas, some of, some of which um, have crystallised during the last couple of days. Uh, one, uh, which is the modification of an idea which we have um, aired before, which was that the um, published output I'm not talking about the video now, but for those of you who want to uh, translate your, your, your talk into published form, we would obviously very much welcome that. The idea was to try and make that collection of what will become peer-reviewed articles um, into the first issue of a new journal called uh, well, the working title was Post War. Mm -hmm. It was to try and capture. What sometimes people forget, including ourselves, is one of the charitable aims of the larger society. Um, first of all, is to promote um, knowledge and appreciation of Larkin himself, Larkin, Larkin works, I should say. Um, the second part is, and his literary contemporaries. And we have, I think, since 1995 when we started, um, more or less concentrated on Larkin rather than his contemporaries. And we have had comments over the years that this is an area we're neglecting. And if that's why, not the only reason, but that's why it's wonderful to hear voices on other poets. Um, and during this conference, and that scope was um, intended to be the scope of the new journal. We have discussed that ambition with Manchester University Press, who, who welcomed it. Um, I have to say, quite honestly, the, yeah, the, the ambition, let's call it stalled for the moment, because the, um, the, the people involved in the editorial board, and the editing, uh, we've lost, unfortunately, two of those who've sadly abandoned academia. Um, one of whom, James Underwood, has only recently published a, a brilliant book on early larking. Um, and he's the chair of our publication of the Bible board on the, the society, and will continue to be so. Um, but he was one of the um, few people who could play a major role in the new journal. Another one, Kyra Piperides, who's 
made a similar decision, even though her book uh, is coming out next year, I think it is. Um, but faced with this, we've had to store that ambition. Um, we have James Underwood um, did look for, for the possibilities and have reported back that he was not convinced. So, but we're not abandoning the idea of publishing some of the proceedings from this uh, conference. So I still, just to clarify, would urge you, if you are, are thinking of putting what you've uh, run out into uh, publishable form, then please carry on doing so and, and let, let us have it, because we will find ways of publishing it, either in about marking or if we get enough into a small proceedings, um, we can determine to carry on with our ambition to publish uh, with more academic vein, not, not uniquely academic, but with more academic vein. So that is a part of uh, Let's Please. Um, next year um, is the, since we can work like a lot of literary societies, by anniversary. It's the 50th anniversary of Larkin's Oxford Book of um, 20th century English verse. Um, and we're hoping to build uh, some event around that, maybe a, a day conference. Um, people have been asking me, is this an annual conference or is it going to be an annual conference? That's the decision which, which has not yet been made. But, I'm so pleased with the success of this conference. It seems to me a shame just to draw a line under that, that, that format. The major project, though, in the what next um, for the Larkin Society is we hope over year, over the coming years, to acquire 32 Pearson. Um, keep quiet about this because the people in 32 Pierce are not going to Centre 
in where the Larkin Archive is. Um, but they're in brown cartons, and it always seems to me that it would be very good to get them on show somewhere. Um, but they do tell a lot about the man and the poet itself. So that's a, a, a longer term project. As for the society itself, I reminded myself the other day that um, 2019, pre COVID, as we say, um, our membership had fallen. Uh, it, it had been over 300. Um, at one point, it had fallen to about 240, something like that. Um, it's now 370. Um, I'm not saying a pandemic is a good thing, <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it seems to me not a coincidence that that's happened because we had to abandon, like everybody else, events. So we, we put a lot more energy, we're already doing things on social media, but we put a lot more energy into social media. And uh, uh, thereby, you know, reached a much, much greater audience, some of whom translated their interest into becoming a member, as, as I imagine some of you here might do, uh, if you're not already. Um, so it's, it goes back and forth. And that ship, of course, at the end of the renewal year, you lose people and you get the new ones and, and so on. Um, but our aim is, is to try to, to, to find hundreds in the next stage. Um, in the process of renewal, the probably the case that I'm the oldest trustee of Hackley, and I thought about it tonight. Um, <laughs> We've got new trustees. The original group of trustees, I was one of the founder, founding three of the, uh, the society back in 1995, uh, um, tended, the, the original trustees tended to be local. They knew market, had no market. Um, so Gene Hartley, the Brennan, Monica didn't want to engage. Um, and, and neither did Betty Macris, who's still with, with us, by the way, in the nursing home in Hazel. Um, those original trustees uh, have been replaced by a much younger group of um, trustees and much more widely dispersed you know, in, uh, in Cambridge and Brighton, Sheffield. Uh, various points on the campus, um, which is all healthy for a society which claims to be not just national, but international. Um, so I think the future is in, in, in safe hands. Um, we're also interested in, this is why I this paper fascinating me, about what the future generations will make of Larkin. One of our most recently retired trustees and one of the earliest, Don Lee, some of you will know. Um, a man who, who wouldn't um, let go of a bus ticket that Larkin used. He's a great archivist um, and in many ways very traditional. But we had an exercise pre-COVID, uh, what are the strategic priorities for the Larkin Society over the next few years? And everybody's put in their success. And the, the most surprising to me, the one that I'm delighted to read, is Don, who said, you need to stop thinking about the idea of a literary society as it exists now. It's in other words, it's had its day. You have to rethink what a literary society is in the 21st century. And um, he was referring to, to social media and internet. And uh, that's something we haven't worked our way through. But I was, I'd circulated to my colleagues the other day 
uh, a journal some of you may have come across, may not have recognized it as a journal called Antigone, Antigone sorry, um, which has to do with, with my guess, the classics of the Greco Roman world. And they publish three articles a week. So they say, into your email box, you will get an article on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday. Um, and these articles are not academic articles in sort of sense of kind of an academic journal. The target audience is 15 to 30 year olds. And anybody submitting anything has to bear that in mind. Uh, and it has a dramatic impact, of course, about how those articles are produced and what's in them. But it's, as soon as I read that and went through their website, I had in my mind what Don Lee said. I know that the literary society um, in the future may look very different. My main focus on 15 to 30 year olds. And then, you know, once you capture that interest, then um, it, it, it stays with them. So we're trying to think in. Um, on their adventurous terms, it takes time to work these things through and some things may not work at all. Um, but we want to try. Could I thank you all for coming? Could um, I thank the presenters for being of uh, terrific quality? It, it, it's been great to hear so much poetic text you know, there is um, there's always a fear of Larkin that you get distracted into the life. <coughs> and sometimes going through the life is a way to the text. And I started lecturing on uh, French poetry. I remember talking to very distinguished, or distinguished, I haven't a okay, uh, professor and asked him how he introduced students to Baudelaire. The way I did it, I mean, I come from a stylistic background, you know, so I was uh, talking about rhyme screens and um, meters and everything to do with structure. Uh, and his answer was drugs and sex. Which <laughs> <laughs> uh, shocked me, not because I was by sex and drugs, but, but that was the way in. I've been brought up in a tradition where I've been studying Baudelaire for 12 years through A-level university master's uh, research degree, uh, steadfastly refusing to read a single biography. <laughs> I only came to a biography when I left on Baudelaire for about two years at Queen's University Belfast. Um, and so I still think, you know, that that's where my emphasis is on the text, and then uh, let's see what happens in life afterwards. I hope you enjoy those of you who are going on the tour, uh, the tour of the library, seeing Larkin's office. Not exactly as it was at the time, because the library has changed dramatically. It had about 26 million pounds spent on it about five years ago, um, but they kept the essentials. Uh, and it's um, been on a tour a, a few times, and you will <laughs> enjoy it. Can I just repeat one last thing before I say goodbye? It's just to uh, remind you of what Philip Pullen said earlier about this immersive show, which is in the central library. Um, on during the library opening hours, and if I'd done my work properly, I would know what we were on Friday. But, uh, um, it is. It's worth going to. It, it, it really is. Uh, it's an extraordinary and unique way of looking at Larkin's. Simultaneously shown on five screens uh, with music, the reading of poetry by Larkin and by others, uh, put an emphasis on jazz and Larkin's photography and, uh, uh, and moving pictures. Not that there are many of them. But Larkin but he uses the monitor for, for example. For that. If you if you've got a late train or you're staying overnight, then uh, please bear that in mind.
Can I just thank? I'm just about to tell you that uh, I'm afraid it was only open in the morning today, but if you're still here tomorrow, it's only 10 till 4 tomorrow. 10 till 4. Okay, thank you, Dean. I ask you to show your appreciation for Lynn, who's done the major. <laughs>